Hi everyone. I hope that you you hear me. Uh, thank you for joining our virtual lecture with our guest speaker, Professor Will Burns from Western University. It is a great pleasure to have you all here today. My name is Oban Zau, and I would like uh, just to say a few words about our monthly lecture uh, series on energy transition and climate governance. Our program is funded by the European Commission through the H2020 program and Mercury Actions. And our research covers a variety of topics, including energy law and climate policy. On a monthly basis, we convene uh, speakers to, to address um, different topics relating to the challenges of our time. As part of this program, we'll have on October the 13th, Professor Joe Aldi from uh, Harvard Kennedy School of Government at uh, Harvard University. And on uh, October the 28th, Professor TBC Morgan D from Queen Mary University of London School of Law. Uh, both of them will lecture on energy uh, related matters. For more information, please visit our website www.law that uh that edu slash inner center slash i now turn it over to professor tracy hester co-director of the center for carbon management in energy ccme at the university of houston and <clears throat> we'll be sharing the, the panel with uh, professor victor flat uh, uh, up until he leaves us over to you tracy Great. Thank you very much, Alvon. And, and welcome, everybody. It's a great pleasure to see you here for our speaking event today. Uh, before we begin, just a quick note. Uh, this is part of our speaker series for the Environment, Energy, and Natural Resources Center at the University of Houston Law Center. We are focused on the legal issues created by the uh, transition to carbon-free energy, but also more broadly, the environmental and legal issues created by energy systems in general. Uh, it is a fascinating platform to explore across disciplinary issues, and it's a great pleasure for me to co-direct that with Professor Victor Flatt and Professor Gina Warren. Uh, as part of that to remit, we also have our monthly speaker series, which Alban has done an outstanding job in helping us organize. Now, our speech today is a particular treat for me. Uh, one area of interest for me in research is climate interventions, including oceanic interventions. And our speaker today is a world-class expert. Um, hold on one second. I, I think is every, before we begin, uh, I am maintaining a chat window open. If you have issues, please let me know and I will try and see if I can address them. Uh, I've gotten one message that someone just can't hear so I will try and turn on closed captions in a minute so that you can at least read even if you're having sound difficulties. That also is a nice transition before I introduce our speaker in that uh, if you have questions or issues that you would like for us to discuss and uh, you don't feel like raising your orange hand electronically, uh, if you put it into the chat box, uh, Professor Flat, Professor Warren and I will see if we can make sure it's presented to our speaker at the right moment during his presentation. With that, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Will Burns. It's one of those rare situations where you get to introduce not only a colleague, but a friend. Uh, Will is a, a, a world-class expert on the legal issues surrounding climate interventions, but he's also a professor of research and a founding co-executive director for the Institute for Carbon Removal Law and Policy at American University in Washington, DC. Excitingly, he has also now recently become a visiting professor at the Environmental Policy and Culture Program at Northwestern University. Congratulations, Will. Uh, in that regard, uh, prior to that, he was a founding co-executive director for the former client in engineering assessment at American University, director of energy policy and climate programs at John Hopkins University, and has taught at Northwestern University of Chicago, Stanford, and University of California, Berkeley. Uh, he's also served as Assistant Secretary of State for Policy for the state of Wisconsin and has worked in the environmental nonprofit sector for 20 years. Uh, he's been very active in bar and professional organizations. He was the 2019 recipient of the Associated Environmental Studies and Sciences Lifetime Achievement Award for scholarship and service, and he has uh, published over 80 publications. Uh, his topic today is one that is increasingly becoming a central one for climate policy, which is 
removing carbon dioxide and other carbon compounds from ocean waters. And with that, well, the mic is yours. Thank you so much, Tracy. Uh, thank you to, uh, to you as well as uh, Professor Flatt for inviting me. Uh, I think I taught a, a mini course in climate change law at Houston probably at least a decade ago. Uh, so it's, uh, it's nice to be back, even if it's uh, virtual. Um, and I'd like to apologize at the outset. I have to teach right after this. So I am doing this from a, a, a basement room uh, at the, uh, in, in my classroom building. And the light is really bad. And the bandwidth is also bad. So during my presentation, I will go off video. And then, I mean, off, uh, yeah, off video and then come back uh, at the end. So let me see if I can share my screen first. Okay, and all right. Can everyone see that? All right, great. So as I said, I'm going to stop my video now and start. Okay, so as everyone knows, the Paris Climate Agreement, which entered into force, establishes the salutary objectives of, try, of keeping temperatures to well below 2 degrees Celsius and at least trying to hold temperatures to below 1.5 degrees Celsius. Unfortunately, if you look at the uh, nationally determined uh, uh, contributions or pledges that countries have made to date, uh, they're tepid in comparison. And as a consequence, many research shops believe that temperatures by the end of this century will rise by three degrees Celsius or even more if some of those commitments are, are not met. And temperature increases of this magnitude could uh, potentially, be, uh, uh, potentially be disastrous. Um, hold on one second, this is not advancing though. Hold on, let's see what's going on. My slides are not advancing. Okay, let's see, I may have to do it this way. Okay, so temperature increases of this uh, magnitude could be potentially disastrous for both human institutions and ecosystems. For example, if temperatures rise three degrees Celsius, it could result in a complete melting of the Greenland ice sheet. The good news is this would take a thousand years. The bad news is, is the melting of that single landmass would raise sea level an astounding seven meters. Virtually all the world's coral reefs, which provide critical habitat for at least a third of all marine species, could be lost under a three degree uh, Celsius uh, temperature scenario. A three to four degree Celsius increase in temperatures could threaten 60% of the world's species, ultimately with extinction. It could also result in potentially catastrophic declines in agricultural production and huge increases in uh, disease vectors. And once we cross this threshold, we'd be stuck for hundreds to thousands of years with these scenarios. So the specter of climatic changes of this magnitude has substantially increased interest in so-called uh, uh, carbon dioxide removal options, uh, which as you can see here is defined as options that aim to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and store it uh, or uh, utilize it for, uh, for products. And indeed, uh, we're looking at a need for carbon dioxide removal, even with titanic efforts to reduce emissions on an extremely large scale. According to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in its fifth assessment report, and most likely in its sixth assessment report, if we are to hold temperatures to below two degrees Celsius and certainly 1.5, we are going to have to both essentially zero out emissions at some point, and we're also going to have to remove somewhere between 13 to 20 gigatons, that's billion tons of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere annually, starting by about the middle of the century. Uh, to put this in perspective, we'll likely have to sequester somewhere between 400 to 1,000 uh, uh, gigatons of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere ultimately. And that is, at the upper level would be equivalent to 25 years of our current emissions. Well, the focus until a few years ago was on terrestrial or atmospheric-based carbon dioxide removal options. There's increasing recognition in recent years that these options may prove too risky or unsustainable at very large scales. 
And this has resulted in more focus in the past few years on the potential viability of a portfolio of marine-based uh, carbon dioxide removal options. Uh, this is especially uh, pertinent because the world's oceans already naturally remove about 10 gigatons of carbon dioxide annually, and many believe that it is fit for purpose to do much more. The purpose of this presentation is to tr try to provide an overview of marine uh, carbon dioxide removal approaches uh, as well in terms of potential benefits as well as potential risks, and also to look at how uh, these uh, uh, approaches might be governed. Uh, I'll tell you at the outset, my emphasis will be on the role of international law, but I will very briefly at the end talk about the potential role of domestic law in this context also. So first of all, let's start off with a overview of marine carbon dioxide uh, removal uh, options. And uh, I will look uh, at uh, four of them. I would emphasize that there are others, uh, but these are the ones that are being discussed most at this point. And in some cases we have uh, even uh, uh, private companies that are actively working on these. The first one that we look at is something called ocean iron fertilization or OIF. Now, the essence of understanding the process of ocean iron fertilization is to understand the role of microscopic plants found in the world's oceans, which are called phytoplankton. Phytoplankton uh, take up carbon dioxide and use them in photosynthetic processes, much as trees do on land. Indeed, half of all the photosynthesis that occurs on Earth uh, is effectuated through uh, phytoplankton. Phytoplankton obtain energy through the process of absorbing this carbon dioxide from the oceans. They convert it to organic carbon, which is stored in the organism's uh, tissues. Now, most of this organic carbon that's produced in this photosynthetic process is immediately consumed at the surface by other species and then released into the atmosphere. However, a small portion of the remainder of this carbon is effectively removed from the system and transported to the deep ocean for storage uh, when the phytoplankton die uh, in a process that we call the biological pump. Some researchers have argued uh, that we could uh, massively increase uh, the, the assemblage of phytoplankton in the world, and as a consequence, substantially increase sequestration through this photosynthetic process. Now, how would this be done? Well, the theory is, is that there are certain areas of, of the world, most prominently the Southern Ocean, that have the optimal level of critical uh, 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 micronutrients, uh, such as phosphorus and nitrogen for, for optimal growth, but have a shortage of a critical macronutrient, and that macronutrient is iron. And so what they've proposed to do is to seed these areas uh, with uh, ferrous sulfate particles. And the argument is, is that, again, this will result in a massive increase in phytoplankton production and uptake of carbon dioxide. And as the CO2 is taken up from the oceans, uh, the pressure differential between the oceans and the atmosphere will facilitate more atmospheric carbon entering uh, the oceans. Now, early on, uh, there were wildly enthusiastic claims about ocean iron fertilization. Some said that it could, uh, for virtually no money, uh, sequester as much as 25% of all of the uh, CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, but questions have arisen since then. One, is that likely to be true? And there's a, plenty of reasons to believe that uh, it is not. Now, this is one of the carbon removal approaches where we've actually had field experiments and been able to test it. And some of these field experiments, as you can see in this one, show that when you do dump iron into these areas, you do get proliferation of, uh, of algae, phytoplankton. But the question is, is uh, does most of that uh, uh, phytoplankton that takes in carbon dioxide, uh, do they die quickly or are they consumed at surface where again, the CO2 would be released? And what we found is that in the uh, vast majority of cases in these studies, uh, we've seen almost immediate consumption at surface by uh, zooplankton species. Essentially, what you've done is you've created a gigantic sushi bar and everybody feasts on it and a lot of the CO2 is subsequently uh, released. So as our models have become more sophisticated, ocean iron fertilization's prospects have seemed less and less hopeful. Only three of the 12 uh, iron addition experiments have demonstrated substantial sequestration of CO2. Uh, 
Uh, more recent studies have concluded that at most, perhaps this could reduce concentrations of the atmosphere by somewhere between five and 10%, and some more recent studies have been even uh, less sanguine. Uh, however, proponents argue that the jury is out, uh, that we should do more long range studies uh, to try to look at effectiveness. However, another question is whether there's risks in dumping large amounts of iron into sensitive ocean ecosystems. And you can probably guess the, the answer to that. Um, and this is true on a number of different uh, axes. First of all, uh, if you do get a proliferation of phytoplankton, it's not like Macy's. You don't get to pick and choose what you want, okay? You get the kind of phytoplankton that are produced in that ecosystem. And one of the things that we're afraid of is that there might be a rise of, of phytoplankton species which are un, uh, undesirable for, up, uh, for uh, uh, upper level trophic species to consume or potentially even toxic. For example, in one of these field studies in the last decade, the abundance and biomass of one phytoplankton species called Phaeocystis antarctica uh, increased massively and essentially crowded out other phytoplankton species in the area. However, it proved unpalatable to mesozooplankton species in the region. And if this had been done at a basin-wide scale, as opposed to simply about 100 square kilometers, it could have wreaked havoc in that ocean ecosystem. Ocean iron fertilization could also privilege fast-growing species of phytoplankton, including pseudonychia, which produces domelic acid, a neurotoxin that can kill mammals and seabirds. So that's one thing that we worry about. Second of all, by increasing the uptake of nutrients in the regions where ocean iron fertilization occurs, we're afraid that, that downstream ecosystems might be robbed of those nutrients. Recent studies that have indicated that this could occur to a very large extent. And in the Southern Ocean, um, a lot of those nutrients are critical for uh, areas that are north of the Southern Ocean, including some extremely important uh, fisheries. Fertilization could also result in widespread eutrophication as the proliferation of algae could choke off light to species. Uh, we also worry paradoxically that it might exacerbate climate change by creating anoxic environments in which methane and nitrous oxides are released, which are two far more potent greenhouse gases than carbon dioxide. Uh, so ocean iron fertilization, I'd say, has become a lot more suspect as we've looked at it more. But again, it continues to be in the mix for, uh, uh, for uh, many uh, in, in our community. A second approach uh, that is being discussed widely now is something called ocean alkalinity enhancement, or OAE. When carbon dioxide enters the oceans, it reacts with water and it forms carbonic acid. Uh, this acid then dissociates, breaks up into hydrogen ions and bicarbonate ions. Over time, calcifying organisms convert these bicarbonate ions into calcium carbonate, which forms the basis of their shells and skeletons. When these organisms die, they sink to the bottom of the ocean, and a portion of this calcium carbonate is buried, effectively resulting in long-term storage of carbon dioxide in mineral form. However, in recent years, the burgeoning uptake of carbon dioxide in the oceans has limited conversion of CO2 into bicarbonate and carbonate sediments by making the oceans more acidic, which has limited the ability of oceans to absorb more carbon dioxide. Enhanced ocean alkalization is a process that involves adding alkalinity to the oceans, which would increase their pH and facilitate, ultimately, the theory is, uptake of more carbon dioxide. The substances that we might use could include silicate rich minerals such as olivine or basalt or artificial substances such as, uh, as lime. Another option would be accelerated weathering of limestone, which involves promoting dissolution of limestone in a reactor with seawater and then releasing that into the world's uh, oceans. However, there are challenges and risks associated with this approach uh, also. First of all, uh, we are in the nascent stages, really the theoretical stages of being able to assess how effective this would be in the real world. Some studies predict, for example, that it would only reduce concentrations of CO2 in the atmosphere by about 30 parts per million, while others say somewhere between 166 to 450 parts per million. And I'm not a scientist, but I think uh, we can safely say anything that has that kind of, uh, of range of projections uh, remains in the realm of uncertainty. Another potential issue is cost. 
Uh, it's been estimated that this approach at a large scale could cost about $3 trillion annually. Um, so certainly there are opportunity costs, and one has to consider those vis-a-vis uh, -vis other potential ways of addressing uh, climate change. There's also potential risks associated with this approach. First of all, the process could potentially disadvantage marine organisms that aren't able to concentrate uh, carbon within their cells under conditions of increased alkalinity, such as littoral crabs. Uh, it could also cause spontaneous precipitation of large amounts of calcium hydroxide, and this uh, turbidity could adversely impact uh, coral reefs. Um, it could also release uh, contaminants uh, uh, from alkaline minerals such as olivine, which can include cadmium, nickel, chromium, iron, and silicon. And so we need to assess whether those would rise to levels that would be potentially perilous uh, in uh, marine ecosystems. Third approach that we're looking at is something called artificial ocean uh, uh, upwelling. Uh, upwelling seeks to stimulate uh, production of, of phytoplankton, again, in marine environments by drawing nutrient-rich waters from beneath the uh, photic zone or the light zone uh, to the surface. And so, again, stimulation of phytoplankton results in more uptake, in theory, of, uh, of carbon dioxide. Uh, techniques for doing this could include gi uh, gigantic sea pumps powered by offshore uh, wind farms or wave power or plastic floating tubes uh, that would be uh, submerged hundreds of meters deep in the ocean. One question is, uh, is effectiveness of this approach, however. Some estimates have said that it might only be a, a, a gigaton of uh, CO2 that would be taken up annually. Others estimate higher amounts, but even at the lower level, some argue that it could be part of a portfolio of responses that ultimately uh, remove 15 to 20 gigatons of CO2 from the uh, atmosphere annually. There's also risks with this approach. Uh, the, uh, it could uh, exacerbate uh, ocean acidification. Uh, it could also substantially restructure ocean ecosystems by favoring larger phytoplankton, such as diatoms. Uh, it could also uh, result in, uh, in changes in, uh, in temperatures in the ocean uh, that could be too quick for some species to adjust to. And so it's, it's unclear at this point what those risks may be. And then finally, um, the last one, is macroalgae cultivation. Essentially, the idea here is to, uh, is to spray seaweed uh, uh, or kelp spores on, uh, on strings uh, that would then be wrapped around ropes, that would then be wrapped around uh, structures that would be floating in the ocean, such as, as buoys. And the idea would be is that as the kelp grew, uh, it would take in carbon dioxide through the photosynthetic process, and then at some point it would become so heavy it would sink with these uh, with these buoys. And when the kelp sank to the bottom of the ocean, uh, it uh, it could be buried in sediments, potentially storing CO2 uh, for thousands of years. Recent studies have uh, suggested uh, that uh, this approach potentially uh, could uh, sequester uh, perhaps uh, less than a gigaton of CO2, but again, some others claim uh, that it could be much greater. Um, we're again at very early stages with this. There are a couple of companies, uh, uh, one on the East Coast and one on the West Coast of the United States that have started engaging in field experiments in this context. Uh, but there's also risks associated with this approach. One is obviously species entanglements and millions of buoys with ropes and lines. Uh, one of the companies running Tide has estimated that to do this at large scale, you're probably going to need a couple million of these buoys out in the ocean, right? So that's going to be a, a, a potentially interfere with not only shipping lanes, but uh, the viability of species. Another issue is opportunistic feeding of some species. Uh, again, you're going to create a gigantic sushi bar, but it's going to be a better sushi bar for some species than others. And that might result in massive population growth of those species, crowding out others in an ecosystem and restructuring that ecosystem in a way that is not uh, propitious in the long term. And the last thing that we worry about is the potential for invasive species uh, uh, catching a ride on these buoys and then drifting into uh, coastal areas. And so essentially visiting uh, massive increases in invasive species in some of these areas as a result of, of large scale deployment. 
so with that in mind, uh, the, the other question I want to look at is if we decide to proceed further with field research in this context and potential deployment, how might we govern this? Because one of the things I think is clear is certainly in terms of these open ocean approaches, there are potentially transboundary impacts uh, in, the, in terms of the global commons, as well as in terms of uh, exclusive economic zones. And that obviously uh, creates concern for governance. So I wanna look at some of the uh, potential nodes in which governance might occur. Now, when ocean iron fertilization uh, experiments began uh, in the last decade, uh, a, a couple of uh, treaty regimes essentially freaked out uh, with this uh, new approach and started uh, uh, passing resolutions to try to regulate it. And so we already have uh, somewhat of a regulatory framework in place uh, for uh, uh, at least some uh, marine carbon removal approaches. Uh, the first of these regimes uh, is the London Convention. The London Convention, sometimes called the London Dumping Convention, was established in 1972 to regulate um, uh, throwing things into the ocean and the potential negative impacts that this could have in terms of human health or ecosystems. Uh, so in 2008, the parties to the uh, London Convention passed a resolution on ocean iron fertilization. And as you can see, uh, it, there was good news and bad news for those that uh, wanted to do ocean iron fertilization. The good news is, is that the convention held that it didn't constitute dumping uh, under an exception to the convention that says that if you're placing materials in the oceans for a purposes other than mere disposal, it might not constitute dumping. Okay, and so they said ocean iron fertilization, you're obviously not putting the iron in there to throw it away, you're trying to accomplish another purpose, which is carbon sequestration, so it doesn't constitute dumping. However, uh, that exception says that you have to comport with uh, uh, the, the, uh, the spirit and provisions of the convention. And what the party said was in order to do that, uh, so there would be uh, uh, substantial conditions placed on, on these, this research. First of all, uh, it could only occur for research purposes, okay? Legitimate scientific research purposes, i.e. you could not be putting iron in the oceans to try to uh, take up carbon and then sell credits, for example, on the voluntary uh, uh, carbon market, okay? Um, second of all, uh, they indicated that it had to be small scale, uh, though they didn't define that term. And then third of all, they indicated that uh, any of these experiments were subject to a risk assessment protocol uh, that the parties subsequently put in place. So uh, any national that wishes to engage in ocean iron fertilization, if they're a party state to the London Convention, has to get their national government to sign off on the, uh, the results of this uh, risk assessment uh, protocol. Now, while this established a, a framework uh, for regulation in this context, it has some serious limitations. First of all, as is true with many international environmental agreements, resolutions passed by the parties are not legally binding, though they obviously exert some moral suasion on the parties. Second of all, the resolution focused on ocean iron fertilization only, although it also referred to other activities that fall within the scope of the London Convention. Uh, so it, it, that could cause harm to the marine environment. So it certainly provided wiggle room uh, to be applicable to other approaches, but for now the focus was just on ocean iron fertilization. So if one were to engage in ocean alkalization or, uh, or macro algae farming, unclear uh, whether it would, it would apply uh, directly. Third of all, uh, it would only apply uh, to marine-based marine -based options that involve placement of, of, of materials or matter uh, in the oceans. So for example, it's not clear if it would be applicable to ocean upwelling, which uh, uh, places uh, some temporary uh, installations in the oceans, but doesn't really add any materials permanently. And so that's something that would have to be worked out ultimately if this kind of research uh, uh, ensues. And uh, we're likely to see that soon. China uh, is, is planning to engage in, uh, in, uh, in experiments in this context uh, uh, very, uh, very soon. A second uh, potential uh, uh, regulatory approach is under the London Protocol. And the London Protocol is contemplated to be the successor to the London Convention. When all parties have, uh, have joined 
uh, the protocol, the convention is to be phased out. The protocol in many ways is far more stringent in its regulation of, of materials in the, uh, in the ocean. So in 2013, uh, the parties to the, uh, uh, to the uh, London Protocol uh, passed a, uh, a, an amendment uh, to the uh, protocol. And as you can see, it, uh, it expanded the potential purview of regulation to all potential marine geoengineering activities, right? And it defined that as deliberate intervention in the environment to manipulate natural processes, right? So that is a definition that is so capacious, it could encompass virtually anything you were doing uh, to, to take up carbon dioxide, right? Uh, so it wasn't limited to ocean iron fertilization, and it would seem to encompass things, including ocean upwelling, as if as this would be an intervention to manipulate natural processes. Um, though initially what it did was it focused on ocean iron fertilization, and it established a permit process with the same kind of criteria that we saw in the resolution. Essentially, it can only be for scientific research purposes and subject to, um, uh, to uh, a, a risk protocol. Okay, um, but there are uh, limits uh, to uh, to this amendment also in a, in a number of ways. Uh, first of all, the amendment itself can't come into force until two thirds of the parties to the protocol accept it, which would require 34 parties at this point. And currently only six have accepted it. So there's a long way to go before this amendment could become legally binding. Second of all, uh, the London Protocol only binds 51 states, and most notably one of the non-states is the United States, right? And a lot of the ocean CDR work that's being done is happening uh, in the United States with U.S. nationals. Um, and, then, um, and then finally, again, uh, it's, uh, it's likely uh, that uh, there may be some ocean approaches uh, that, uh, that won't even be encompassed in here, uh, in terms of solar radiation management approaches, for example, but in terms of CDR, uh, probably most likely all of them. The second regime that mobilized when ocean iron fertilization experiments began last decade was the Convention on Biological Diversity. And so in 2010, the CBD passed a resolution that essentially uh, mirrors what the London Convention did, right? It said, uh, uh, there has to, uh, uh, until there's adequate scientific basis to justify such activities um, and an appropriate consideration of risks, all you can do is uh, scientific research. So again, with no uh, commercial uh, uh, value and, uh, and subject to thorough prior uh, risk assessment, okay? Um, and and and, and uh, subsequently, they passed a resolution in 2012 that defined uh, marine geoengineering or geoengineering uh, to encompass, quote, any deliberate intervention in the planetary environment of a nature and scale intended to counteract anthropogenic climate change and its impacts. So again, all encompassing, not only of marine based approaches, but also uh, terrestrial approaches. Uh, but the CBD and this resolution also have some real uh, uh, limitations. First of all, again, uh, the resolutions of the CBD are not legally binding. Um, second of all, uh, minor details, again, uh, the primary country that is engaged in marine CDR at this point, the United States, is not a party uh, to the uh, CBD. Um, third of all, the language in the ge geoengineering resolutions that they've passed are pretty squishy. Uh, they invite countries to consider the guidelines that are, are provided. So uh, it seems half-hearted uh, at, at most, but it's probably a, a recognition that a lot of what the CBD calls for isn't obeyed anyway. Other regimes were potentially pertinent uh, in, the, in, in the future in terms of both research and deployment of these uh, approaches. Obviously, one of them is UNCLOS, the Law of the Sea Convention. If you look at Article uh, 238 and 239 of UNCLOS, it clearly provides for a right to conduct marine scientific research. And so uh, it, it, it provides, at least on the surface, uh, a uh, authorization to, to test out uh, th some of these kinds of uh, approaches. And indeed, this is a cornerstone of, of UNCLOS. Uh, but uh, there are limitations that are placed on this that uh, would clearly be significant. 
First of all, if, a, if uh, the nationals of one country seek to uh, do this in the, the waters of another country, uh, it would be subject to the uh, authorization of these coastal states, right? Uh, including the right to regulate it uh, and the right to, uh, uh, for, uh, to demand uh, express consent and conditions that they could set forth. Now, what would happen uh, in uh, in areas uh, uh, beyond uh, the uh, uh, EEZs. Well, in these areas, uh, uh, it says that all states have the right uh, to conduct marine scientific research uh, beyond the limits of the exclusive uh, uh, economic zones, but again, in conformity with the uh, uh, with the convention, and uh, some of those conditions uh, could be terribly pertinent if uh, one were to engage either in research that potentially created harms in the marine environment or large scale uh, deployment. So, if uh, serious negative impacts were uh, manifested by research or deployment, um, it could run afoul of pollution provisions of UNCLOS. Article 263 provides for uh, responsibility and liability uh, if uh, conditions are not met, including uh, efforts to uh, to uh, uh, reduce potential risks to the to the to the most practical means, consultation, and, and so forth. Uh, and this the definition of pollution uh, is uh, it, in UNCLOS is clearly broad enough to encompass uh, any of the things we're talking about. It talks about introduction of matter and energy, for example, which would encompass, I think, uh, any marine CDR approach that uh, uh, that I could think of. Uh, again, uh, Article 194 would provide uh, for uh, taking measures to prevent and control pollution of the marine environment. So minimizing and seeking to ameliorate any of the harms associated with any of the approaches uh, that, uh, uh, that we talked about. Moreover, uh, it could uh, potentially give a rise to, uh, uh, to liability uh, should uh, uh, responsible states or, and their nationals not uh, uh, meet their obligations in terms of the uh, uh, of the uh, treaty. But again, this is not absolute liability, right? It requires that uh, engaging in marine CDR, uh, uh, states or their nationals should take all necessary measures to minimize the adverse impacts of the project, notification of countries, and study the risks uh, and effects of the project and publish uh, results of that study. So there's requirements for uh, due diligence and, uh, and, and certainly um, transparency. Another uh, potential uh, relevant uh, uh, part of UNCLOSE uh, is the emerging uh, BBNJ agreement or Biodiversity Beyond National Jurisdiction. Uh, BBNJ, as you know, is being negotiated at this point, but should it ultimately come into force, uh, these are some of the provisions uh, that could potentially be pertinent, assuming that they uh, survive uh, in, uh, in future drafts. Uh, one is the ability to establish marine protected areas. Should marine protected areas be carved out in the open oceans, it might limit the areas in which these activities, marine CDR activities could take place, or it might place limits on them uh, that would limit their potential utility. And this would be subject to, uh, uh, to negotiations in, in the future. Uh, it also would establish a, uh, a, an environmental impact assessment process, uh, and this environmental impact assessment process might be more stringent than what we currently have. Um, under customary international law and under uh, treaties such as uh, UNCLOS and the CBD, uh, there uh, are provisions for transboundary environmental impact assessment in cases where one's activity might cause harm to other countries, uh, but uh, it, it's pretty squishy in terms of what you need to do in terms of consultation and in terms of whether you need to really uh, 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 alter uh, your uh, approach if there's objections. Uh, under BBNJ, this EIA process may become far more uh, stringent. Uh, and so that will be something to, uh, to look at uh, uh, also. And then obviously, because this uh, talks about uh, climate issues, uh, one question is whether the Paris Agreement uh, will be uh, uh, will be applicable in the future, and I think it certainly could be. If you look at under Article Four, 
uh, and the provisions for nationally determined contributions, uh, the mandate is to pursue, quote unquote, domestic mitigation measures to achieve the, uh, the objectives, uh, the temperature objectives of Paris. So then the question is, what, what constitutes a mitigation measure? Could marine CDR approaches be, be under that rubric? Well, despite the fact that it uses the term mitigation 13 times, Paris doesn't define it, okay? But its uh, parent agreement, uh, the Framework Convention does, right? And it talks about uh, uh, limiting, uh, it talks about mitigation being limiting greenhouse gas emissions and protecting and enhancing sinks and reservoirs. And sinks are things that store carbon. Okay, so I think a good argument could be made uh, that you could claim a carbon removal approach that a country was taking could be part of their mitigation commitments, including uh, marine-based uh, CDR approaches. Um, of course, there's a, a tremendous amount that would need to be done uh, to operationalize that at this point, right? Uh, presumably within the Paris rulebook, we would need provisions for monitoring, uh, and and uh, reporting and verification. And this is far more problematic, I have to tell you, in terms of being able to measure uh, sequestration of carbon and monitor permanence of carbon sequestration in an ocean environment as, as opposed to a terrestrial environment. Uh, but that's something that potentially could be uh, worked on in the, in the future. Um, also, uh, there are preambular provisions that, even though not binding, I think could have some influence in terms of how marine CDR was conducted, right, if it was done under the rubric of the Paris Agreement, right? The preamble says that the parties may be affected not only by climate change, but by the impacts of measures taken in response to it. And so it provides for authority to assess uh, uh, the uh, uh, judiciousness of response measures, which I think could include uh, carbon removal, right? Um, and it also notes the importance of ensuring the integrity of ecosystems, including oceans and biodiversity. And so I think this would provide a hook for more close scrutiny of the potential risks associated with marine CDR should countries begin to claim them under uh, the rubric of their, uh, of their NDCs. Um, the last thing I'd say, or, or the next to last thing I'd say is this customary international law also could potentially play a role here, obviously, including the precautionary principle, uh, the no harm rule, as well as uh, transboundary environmental impact assessment requirements. And then finally, of course, domestic law would be pertinent if some of these activities were conducted within a country's waters. Um, for example, uh, there's been some discussion of uh, blue carbon approaches uh, that would be done within exclusive economic zones. And in the case of the United States, for example, uh, pr uh, tr uh, statutes such as the Marine Protection Research and Sanctuaries Act, the Clean Water Act, the Coastal Zone Management Act, and NEPA uh, would potentially be uh, applied. Uh, but arguably, there's lots of interstices uh, in those. Uh, 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 statutes uh, that were not designed for these kind of purposes that would probably have to be crafted uh, before we proceeded down uh, uh, this path. And so uh, that's going to be an interesting uh, ongoing sort of challenge uh, for, for future generations and probably provide lots of jobs for, uh, for lawyers. Um, and so with that, uh, I will uh, we'll stop and, uh, and uh, open it to uh, questions. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, Will. That was a fabulous presentation. And just to remind everybody, we are set with a uh, chat room function. So if you have questions, we can ask them to, uh, to either with us as media areas. But you also have the capacity to raise your electronic hand and to get into the queue to ask a question directly to Doc Burns. But as always, I will take rank advantage of my moderator's privileges by asking a few questions of my own just to kick things off. And uh, I'll throw it out with a, a curveball to begin. Uh, You've described largely a suite of technologies that use ocean waters to remove atmospheric CO2. But as we know, the oceans themselves are a carbon sink and that we actually have in the marine waters themselves elevated levels of CO2 and carbon. Are there any technologies that would focus on removing CO2 from the waters themselves? And if so, do we end up with a different suite of legal issues or are they largely the same as the ones you've just outlined? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, there are 
uh, some approaches, including uh, uh, electrogeochemical approaches, which essentially would try to separate water into into acids and bases, and uh, and and separate out CO2 uh, for sequestration, uh, that uh, uh, would potentially do that. Uh, I think it, it, I think it's an interesting question. I mean, one of the things that it it would do is is it would reintroduce uh, hydrochloric acid, for example, into the oceans, right? So you, some of the questions related to uh, it, whether this constitutes pollution and what your you know due diligence obligations are to control that uh, would be uh, pertinent. Uh, but in in some of these regimes that talk about placement of materials in the oceans, right? Probably not. Uh, uh, pertinent, right? Because again, uh, the things that you'd use for that process would not be permanently placed there, and so wouldn't fit under that rubric. So, uh, arguably, yeah, there would be some some gaps uh, in terms of some of these uh, regimes, like the 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 London Convention. Now, I think the protocol, uh, since it defines it so broadly, uh, would encompass anything that was used to try to effectuate changes in the climate, right? But uh, uh, it, it maybe not the London Convention. The CBD definition probably broad enough to include everything, right? Because it's anything that again uh, uh, is intervenes to affect the the climate. Um, and unclose if there were if there were these kind of harms through the introduction of energy or matter, um, I think would be applicable. Uh, excellent. It, uh, while we're waiting for more questions to either show up in person or in the queue, I, I of course have another one, and it's a parallel to the one we just asked, which is one of the leading strategies right now proposed for carbon capture is point source capture that then will sequester the CO2 under marine waters, either in the form of a, you know, geologic sequestration. Some proposals even talk about uh, we're introducing the CO2 essentially in a heavier than water liquid form on the ocean bed itself or in shallow sediments. Uh, so I was curious, I, for example, uh, there are three different areas in the United States where we're looking at potentially, you know, uh, you know multi-billion dollar build out of pipeline networks to inject CO2 into the ocean floor. Do you see any possibility for conflict between some of the ocean carbon dioxide removal methods you're talking about, which are using the oceans to remove CO2. At the same time, we may be injecting potentially gigatons of CO2 in the ocean floor at the ocean seabed. Yeah, I think that's possible. And that, that's something that will have to be worked out. I mean, it's, it's uh, it, I think with both terrestrial and ocean-based carbon removal approaches, there are prospects for uh, conflict trade-offs and prospects for synergies. For example, if you look at uh, the terrestrial-based carbon removal approaches, if what you want to do is, uh, if one of the approaches is planting trees, right? Well, if you want to plant massive amounts of trees to take up carbon, uh, that may conflict with planting massive amounts of trees uh, to cut them down and use them for bioenergy with carbon capture and sequestration, right? Um, uh, on the other hand, um, it may be that if you um, if you use something called enhanced mineral weathering, which is to uh, uh, to try to increase the weathering of of uh, minerals like olivine that take up CO2, uh, you might be able to uh, to take uh, those materials and spread them on on croplands, increase their yields, and free up more areas to use for bioenergy feedstocks, for example. Right, so um, I think in the oceans, we're probably going to end up looking at those same kind of questions of whether there's trade-offs uh, and and what the optimal what the optimal mix is and whether there's synergies in some cases. But I think we're at a, such an early stage with most of these, we we, we can't even contemplate what those uh, might be. One of the things I can say is that carbon storage. Uh, uh, in, uh, in in deep ocean areas uh, is is privileged and recognized under a number of regimes. The OSPAR Convention, uh, the London Dumping Convention, uh, recognizes uh, carbon sequestration uh, in the in the oceans. And so, uh, in in many ways, it has a leg up uh, right now. I think on some of these nascent uh, carbon removal technologies. Uh, although, ironically enough, it's U.S. law that seems to be posing a bit of an impediment for geologic sequestration of CO2 offshore. Uh, 
Yeah. Uh, we actually have a question being raised uh, by one of our audience members. Kirsten, uh, would you like to ask your question, Dr. Burns? Yeah, um, Professor Burns, I'm wondering of the CO2 removal options that you discussed, which do you think um, are the most promising? Mm, of the marine ones? Ah, boy, these are, I, I have to say, um, I, despite the fact I spend a lot of time with these, okay, I'm, I'm extremely skeptical uh, about most of them, um, certainly at very large scale. Um, I think probably the, the uh, ocean iron fertilization would be off the table to me. I just think there's so many risks associated with it and so little possible rate of return uh, that it, it just doesn't make sense to me. And, and it create all kinds of geostrategic conflicts as I, as I talked about, uh, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't make sense to me to look at. Um, I think ocean upwelling probably ultimately sequesters so little carbon. Again, it's probably not worth the risks that we, that we talked about. And so I think the other two are the ones that, that have some potential. I think ocean alkalization um, enhancement um, uh, uh, could play a substantial role. Again, what we're going to have to do is engage in uh, in field experiments uh, to determine if we're going to get large releases of, of, of toxic minerals and, and at what levels. Um, and we're going to have to look at issues like alkalosis, right? If, if there's certain species, they aren't going to be able to adjust and, and so forth. But um, if, uh, if those don't seem to be substantial risks, um, I think it potential has has has, has some good good upside. Uh, the other thing that it does is by increasing alkalinity, it potentially helps us with the evil twin of carbon uh, of climate change, which is ocean acidification, right? And so, um, uh, it, 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 anything that provides potential co benefits, I think, help in terms of our risk calculus. Um, that's the same with uh, with uh, kelp farming. Um, kelp farming done, I think, at certain scales provides some potential co-benefits to uh, to other species uh, that make it worthy of looking at. I just don't think you're going to be able to do it at the kind of scale that some of these companies are talking about. And that and that's part of the challenge, incidentally. Once you get the private sector involved in this, um, there's obvious reasons that they want to scale to a very large level, right? I mean. I, I think the private companies to date that have been working on this have mixed motives. Um, I, I think most of these people really do want to help save the world, and that's that's laudatory. Uh, but they also they also want to make money, right? And so they may want to scale up at a level that's not sustainable, and that's why it's going to be really important to have a, a regulatory uh, 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 framework in place that uh, that balances all of these interests that we're talking about. If I could add a small grace note to that, which is I, I second your assessment of ocean iron fertilization as probably the least favored of the suite of technologies right now. And in part, the regulatory certainty method issue you've just mentioned is particularly relevant because we've had some unsanctioned projects take place, which have actually led to civil investigations by Environment Canada, which have kind of cast a domestic liability question as well as the international one. Yeah, yeah. It always that always makes me laugh. I, I'm I'm an advisor to a couple of these companies that are uh, looking to do this, and I always have to laugh when they talk about how they don't want the regulatory people to be involved because it's you know you look at this history. If anything's going to be get a backlash against them, it's it's trying to do this without um, you know working with uh, uh, with uh, state actors on this. Yep, it, it's it's a reasonable investment of time up front. <laughs> yeah. Uh, now, it, also, just uh, we have another question from the chat box. Uh, Sophie Hagen has asked whether or not large scale mangrove restorations might be too late, or I, I'm assuming also it means perhaps too slow to have a measurable impact in time for the change we need. Yeah, yeah. Well, so uh, these the. the when you when we think about uh, blue carbon, most of the time what we're talking about uh, is more of these coastal approaches like mangroves, right? And uh, here's what I'd say about mangrove restoration. First of all, talk about something that has huge co-benefits, right? It's it's almost always compelling to do it. If you look at 
at what's happened even in places like New Orleans with the latest um, uh, hurricane. The, the, some of the arguments are being made that some of the restoration in those coastal areas has helped substantially, as, as it does, has in some other countries with recent violent weather events, including Indonesia. Uh, so uh, on its own, it's, it's compelling probably to, to engage in large scale uh, mangrove restoration. Uh, but as a carbon removal approach, virtually all of those blue carbon approaches together, probably even at very large scale, uh, don't get you more than maybe half a gigaton. Uh, but again, if they have good co-benefits uh, and there's not substantial risks, um, and again, you have to look at these things all the time, because if you're if you're putting large amounts of anything into the water, you may be crowding out fishing interests or tourist interests and things like that. So you always have to weigh these things, make sure that it's not elites trying to get fast carbon credits and, and, and taking out local livelihoods, right? Uh, you have to question everything of this approach uh, with, a, with a bit of a skepticism, I think, even if it seems like you're trying to you know, do good, quote unquote. Uh, but uh, I think mangrove restoration certainly has a role to play, but probably a, a fairly small role. It's more a scale issue than it is a time issue. It's just, you just can't put enough of it in the ocean to sequester huge amounts of CO2. It's, it's hard to get your mind wrapped around the concept of gigatons. It's yeah. an enormous scale we're talking about. Uh, I, I had one other question, and then if maybe time permits, we might have time for one more question from online. Uh, this one is uh, also a little bit sort of in tandem with your prior presentation on ocean-based CDR removal. The other suite of technologies being discussed is albedo modification, things like mm -hmm. marine cloud brightening or yeah. other types of ways to reduce solar insulation reaching the surface of the ocean as a way to counteract climate change. Is there any interaction between, say, we did marine cloud brightening that might also impact ocean carbon dioxide removal, you know, good or bad? And do we need to sort of think about how to integrate those regimes if we decide to pursue both? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, with the caveat that I am not a scientist, and the caveat that uh, that I hadn't really thought about that before, I'll, I'll still proffer an opinion, <laughs> which is uh, possibly, I mean, one scenario I could see, for example, is if marine cloud brightening uh, were to substantially reduce the amount of incoming solar radiation, that could have an impact in terms of primary uh, production in marine ecosystems, right? Because sunlight is, is one of the things that drives the photosynthetic process and phytoplankton growth. And if you're reducing uh, sunlight, it could have impacts. Also, if marine cloud brightening were cooling ocean surfaces, uh, uh, that can effectuate biogeochemical transformations that might change the assemblage of, of species also. So my guess is, but again, you'd want to consult a real scientist, that a lot of these kind of approaches uh, in tandem could potentially have negative impacts on each other, maybe in some cases synergisms, right? But that would all have to be looked at. And we may have to look at that, right? Because as, as you know, better than almost anybody, uh, we're increasingly saying we're so desperate, we may need you know, mitigation, adaptation, traditional mitigation, adaptation, um, carbon removal at very large scales and solar radiation management, right? So probably sooner rather than later, we should be figuring out if what these what these kind of uh, complex uh, interactions might be. Yep. Uh, for those listening online, I suspect there'll be many a future career built on the concept of holistic climate technology management, which uh, you have to sort of strike the right balances between how to use each of these in different circumstances. Yeah, this uh, is likely to be a three to five trillion dollar industry by 2040 carbon removal, right? And anything that has a T in it has a lot of lawyers. Okay. Well, unfortunately, we're still getting great questions online, but I think our time is about up. So let me go ahead and uh, first of all, do the most important job, which is just to thank Dr. Burns for a fabulous presentation. That was, as always, fascinating, and uh, attendees may not realize it, but you have gotten the fruits of a major conference last week that Dr. Burns organized and orchestrated dealing with ocean carbon dioxide removal methods that lasted several days. You just got the cream off the top of it. Uh, with, as always, you're welcome back anytime, as well as all of you online. We do have a series of speakers lined up. And with that thought, I'll pass the baton to Aban to give us a, to close us out and to give us a sense of what's ahead.
Yes, thank you very much, Tracy, and thank you, thank you, Dr. Will, for your your great presentation. So, um, on uh, October the the, 30, the 13th, we have Professor Joe Haldi from uh, Harvard um, uh, Kennedy School of Government. Um, he will he will be addressing an issue related to um, to energy issues and also an issue at stake. But also, we'll have on October the 28th. Professor TBC Morgandi from uh, Queen Mary School, um, Queen Mary University um, of London School of Law, who will be addressing an issue related to energy law. So that's it for me, and over to you again. All right. Well, thank you again, everyone. Uh, have a great day, and we look forward to seeing you at our next speaker event next month. Take care. Thanks, everyone.